this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. Well, maybe some of you. Getting into the high renaissance. Now, you would think that this portion of art history would be a much more extensive uh, part of the exam, but it's not. We only have a couple of artists that we're really going to focus on. We've got Da Vinci, we've got Michelangelo, we've got Raphael, we've got Titian, and we've got one or two architects, but that's it. And some of the pieces that you would think are famous all throughout the world, not even included. How rude. All right, so let's get into the, uh, the high renaissance in Italy uh, in the 1500s. Really, technically it's late 1400s into uh, about 1530. The death of Raphael actually signifies the very end of the high renaissance. So with this post, I'm also uploading the note packet. It is a long note packet, but please make sure to go through it. Also, in this PowerPoint, there's not going to be as much uh, information highlighted in red as there has been in other PowerPoints. So take a listen to what I say. And you know, you want to write down in your binder, though, the key information uh, that I bring up for each piece. All right, so let's get started. Now, we left off, we are still in uh, our unit uh, that we started with the Northern Renaissance. We did the Northern Renaissance, we've done the Early Renaissance. Uh, this is the unit uh, on Europe and America from 1400 to 1750. And we, are, we finished up the uh, Early Renaissance on the last slide, or on the last PowerPoint. And now we're going to get into a period that we talked a lot about in your freshman year in world cultures. If you remember the art gallery, uh, there was a lot of art coming from this period. So we are now in what is considered the High Renaissance. This is the late 1400s, about to the year four, uh, 1530. Again, the year that Raphael dies uh, is the year that the official, it was the official ending of the High Renaissance. So again, we're in the 15th century uh, to early 16th century. That is where we are. Now, just like we looked at location, location, location in the early Renaissance, uh, which was all about the city of Florence, all about trade, all about those wealthy merchants, the location of where a lot of this art is going to be created is not going to be in Florence. Now, some of it will be, but not all of it. Rome becomes the home of the Renaissance. And really, the reason for that is there is a humanist pope uh, named Pope Julius II, and he is going to lead uh, the charge for the creation of new art in this period of history. So again, Rome becomes the center of the High Renaissance, which means which city-state loses its importance? Unfortunately, Florence. And we are going to see the revitalization of Rome under the patronage of Pope Julius II. He's going to spend a lot of that Catholic offering money uh, to create frescoes, create architecture, and all sorts of things that will really define this period in history uh, and really kind of laid down the groundwork for why uh, the Renaissance is so important. And not to be, you know, second fiddle, but the city of Venice also becomes very important during this period. Uh, again, you do need to know who Pope Julius II is. Again, it's in red, so you do want to write it down. He is considered a Renaissance Pope. He's not the only one, uh, but he is important. So not only was the Catholic Church spending money on art, you also had fraternities, which were groups of monks spending money on creating art for their various chapels throughout Italy. You will have wealthy individuals creating art uh, or paying artists to create art as well. Uh, if we think back to who the patrons of the early Renaissance were, hopefully there is one family that jumped out to you that is the Medicis as well as other wealthy merchants. Uh, that's still going to continue, but they are going to take kind of a backseat to the Catholic Church in this era. So some of the elements that you want to think about as we look at the art you are going to see the blending of that idea of humanism. So man is the measure of all things, and you're going to be seeing that applied to Christian art. So what does that mean? Well, you're going to be seeing Christian figures in very realistic settings and depicted in a very realistic way or even sometimes shown in the nude. So that is applying that Greek and Roman idea of humanism 
to Christian art, which is, again, revolutionary. It starts in the early Renaissance with Donatello and that sculpture of David in the nude, uh, and it's going to be continued all the way through into the High Renaissance and even later. Uh, Roman architecture, because, or not Roman, but Renaissance architecture is seen on even a much greater scale than it was, scale than it was in, the, in the early Renaissance. You are going to see uh, architecture that's influenced by humanism. You're going to see that ideas of balance and harmony and rational and symmetrical proportions all incorporated as well as, well as you will see classical motifs. You will see uh, triangular composition favored for the front of buildings. Uh, remember we saw that in the image of the Holy Trinity uh, by Masaccio in our last presentation. All of that is just going to be seen on a greater scale. Uh, and we will also start to see portraits of everyday people. So these portraits are going to reveal the likeness of the sitter and the artist trying to essentially get the psychology of their sitters. That is something that is blending in the idea of humanism in with genre painting, so scenes of people's everyday life, um, and trying to really get their character and personality. We didn't see that in Byzantine art. We didn't see that in Gothic art. We didn't see that in Romanesque. Uh, you kind of really had kind of very plain blanket figures um, and really kind of plain figures anytime a person was shown. Ah, so here we are, the four foundational artists of the Renaissance. Now, you wonder why Donatello's up here? Well, Donatello lived uh, earlier in the 1400s, so he was dead really by the time that Leonardo and Michelangelo and Raphael were all working. Uh, but one of the artists up here that you probably don't know is Titian. So Titian is a Venetian artist. Uh, he deals with a lot of bright colors. Uh, and also he will use oil on canvas to create a lot of his art because remember Venice had a lot of uh, access to trade through northern Europe so they were exposed earlier than the rest of Italy to oil paints and also the use of canvas paints. So we, we are going to really look at Leonardo first, then Michelangelo, then Raphael, and then Titian. Uh, this video that I'm making now, in order to make it not too long, I'm going to break it up between kind of our intro to the High Renaissance and then go a little bit into Leonardo, and then part two will be Michelangelo, Raphael, and Titian. So Leonardo da Vinci, what do you think when you hear the name da Vinci? Well, the term Renaissance man comes from who da Vinci was. He was an actor, he was a scientist, he was an architect, he was a mathematician, he was an inventor, he was a uh, scientist, and that's where the term Renaissance man comes from. He was good at a lot of different things. Now, he spent the majority of his life really working for some wealthy patrons all throughout Italy, uh, some in Florence, some in, in Venice. For a long time, he worked in Milan, where he uh, worked as an inventor for the Duke of Milan, uh, hoping to create military machines, because again, Milan was a military powerhouse. Um, but during his free time, he painted, and he didn't really see himself really all that much as an artist. He did that on the side, uh, to make money. Uh, and really, what's left behind by Leonardo is not that many paintings. I mean, there's no more than 20 Finnish paintings uh, of da Vinci in museums around the world. And the thing that we have the most of by da Vinci are his notebooks. And there are thousands of pages of notebooks uh, that got left behind when he died. And when he died, he actually was living uh, as essentially the court genius for the king of France. So he was living in the south of France in this very, very nice uh, palace, one of the many palaces that the king of France owned, and uh, he died there, kind of uh, surrounded by his two companions, who some people say were his assistants and other people say were his, his lovers, so we don't know. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the background of this guy. So I told you, you know, kind of what he did throughout the, most of his adult life. But he was born in the city Vinci, which is where he gets his name from. So his name is Leonardo of Vinci. And the reason why he is not allowed to take his father's last name is that he is a bastard. His parents uh, were not married and never got married after he was born. Uh, his father was already married. Uh, this was a mistress that... Uh, 
Leonardo was born to, essentially. But his father does take care of him. His father gives him money. His father makes sure that he gets into an art school. And the reason why he goes into an art school is that another artist named Barocchio sees this this child uh, essentially sketching images of animals. And he sees the genius behind this person. And he essentially brings him in, talks to Leonardo's father, and brings him into this art school. Um, and he, again, many, many paintings. Uh, that survive today are either in France or they are in Italy. And some of them are in France because he will die in France, and then other ones are in Italy because that's where he, again, spent a lot of his life working. So this was the painting where, and this is this is kind of a fabled story. Nobody really knows if it's true. Uh, but this is a painting that Leonardo worked on while he was with a master uh, named Verrocchio learning how to paint. So a lot of these artists had essentially workshops where they would employ a bunch of other artists. The master artist, which at this point was Verrocchio, he would uh, get paid by various groups to create art, um, and he would do kind of the initial sketch of the of the work, and then he would have his students come in and finish it. So I want you to take a look at this. Which part of the painting do you think Leonardo did. Now on this slide I have there, you know, which do you think Leonardo did? So there's two angels. They're both kneeling uh, by Christ as he's being baptized by John the Baptist who don't forget is also his cousin. And then we see the representation of the Holy Spirit at the top with the dove. So if you were to think, that you got two angels, both in blue. There's one on the left, one on the right. Take a minute. Think about it. Think why. What characteristics uh, are different about the angel that you chose compared to the other figures and then we'll we'll see what you came up with this is his angel Verrocchio is said now again nobody knows if this is true but Verrocchio is said to have laid down his paintbrush after he saw this he came into the workshop one day after Leonardo was done working on this angel and he says I am never going to be paint again or I am never going to paint again because Leonardo has surpassed me now, what is so great about this painting? Well, the detail in the hair, the detail in the gentle qualities of the face as this angel is looking up at Christ, the shadowing, which is that chiaroscuro uh, around the eyes, around the neck, uh, the ruching of the cheek, just how realistic he was able to make it is what really set Leonardo apart from the rest of the artists working in Florence at this time. Now, one of his earliest, most famous paintings is The Last Supper. And The Last Supper, again, uh, comes from the New Testament. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was hired during one of his periods off from working with the Duke of Milan to create a scene where Christ's disciples are sitting at the Last Supper. And the scene is painted, actually, in the dining hall for a group of priests and monks for a cathedral outside of the city of Milan. Now, what we see here is a couple of symbolic elements. Now, the first symbolic element is we have Christ in that triangular composition. I mean, his entire body is making a triangle. That was that Renaissance innovation that helps people to, or helps to kind of a solidify a painting. And remember, Christ is solidifying the church. He is solidifying God's word uh, that, you know, he is the son of God. Um, and then what we also have is the number three. And we have that number repeated over and over again in this image. So you have the three windows, which represent Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You've got each of the 12 disciples grouped in groups of three. All right, all that is symbolic. Um, he, this is a, a painting that's very large. It takes up the entire wall. The painting is showing a lot of various types of emotion, which again is a Renaissance innovation. Uh, every single figure here is an individual. That is a Renaissance innovation. We have linear perspective views. If you look at the, the squares along the walls, they are all meant to be tapestries, and they are angling our eye towards Christ, who is the center. He, that's where the perspective lines are drawing us. Um, and when Leonardo was making this painting, he was playing around with different ways of mixing uh, paints. And this is a fresco, and the paints that he mixed together, he thought were going to be stronger 
than the paints that were on the market. But what actually ends up happening is within 10 years, the majority of the paint that he adheres to the wall actually flakes off. And what we have left today is really a majority of it is, is not original. And it is a recreation of, of Leonardo's work. Now, there were some images that were created uh, during Leonardo's lifetime of copies of this. So that's how we know that this is what it looked like uh, originally. Uh, if you think of the figures uh, in the painting, you have Christ as the most important figure. And then really the only other three figures that you ever hear referenced are the three figures to the left. And you have John the Baptist, who looks very feminine, uh, but has passed out. John the Baptist was young. You have St. Peter, who is very angry, and he is kind of pulling himself past John the Baptist. And in one hand, he actually has a knife because he is saying, Christ tell me who it is that's going to betray you because I actually forgot to say this this is the moment that Christ says one of you will betray me and they are all reacting to that saying no who will do that that would not be us we are your followers um, and you have St. Peter kind of jumping up with a knife in his hand to say I will kill that person uh, and then if you think about from this story who the person is that will betray Jesus it is Judas and Judas is the one that is completely in shadow he is right here and what he is doing, he is clutching the bag of silver that he was given to rat Jesus out. And if you look at Jesus' hand here and Judas' hand, they are both reaching for the bread that's on the table. And think back to what that symbolizes. That's the bread symbolizes the body of Christ because Christ is going to give up his body uh, for the sins of humanity. And Judas will be the person that will lead him essentially to his death. I have up here just the different people that are incorporated. Now, again, you know, you don't have to write anything down for this slide because it's not in the art history curriculum, but it's an extremely important per piece to know, and that's why I'm going through it. Keep going. Again, you have today what it looks like, basically pretty restored uh, in the area in Milan, the church that it is in. We have Jesus. We have the pyramid, the pyramidal composition. We have the figures as triangles, again, all solidifying kind of that idea of pyramidal composition. And then we have our perspective lines. You see here, you know, everything converges on Christ because he is the most important figure. These were his sketches. Uh, most last or most last supper scenes, uh, you had people on either side of the table. Um, he thought that this though didn't show that balance and that symmetry and that uh, that stability that Renaissance art was now showing. This is the uh, the dining hall where it was located. Uh, you might wonder why is there a big hole under Christ's feet and that was because when the French come in under Napoleon and they take over Italy uh, they will use this room as a stable which is pretty sad and they will drill and create a doorway. In World War II the city was that the church was in was bombed but luckily they had reinforced the wall which you can see right here and uh, that's why the wall survives today and they after the war they rebuilt the church and you can see the wall right here and they rebuilt the church around it and that's what it looks like today and again like I told you the majority of the paint there's very little paint that actually is original to the paint that Leonardo added in the 1500s and again it's been remade over and over again different TV shows have done their own reenactment and if we were in class guess what we would be reenacting we would be doing our own all right and this is the this is the copy that they believe is what it would have looked like uh, closer to the original you can see the feet down below and just like Jesus he's got a zoom meeting and they're all social distancing ha 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 Mr. Hackney, you're so funny. I know, thank you. And these are just some recreations we have done throughout the years. And I wish we could do them with you guys. Unfortunately, we can't. Actually, if you look back in that, the day back there, we, I did this almost a year ago from where we are today. So we're going to kind of go through these. We're going to skip through this since it's not in the art history curriculum. Blah, blah, blah. And then we have the Mona Lisa. So the Mona Lisa is a painting that is illustrious in, in art history. 
Uh, the reason why it's, it's in the Louvre today is because Leonardo worked on this painting from the time it was created to when he died, and that's why it's in France and not Italy. Um, it's been stolen a couple times, which has led to some of its mythology, which has led to the reason why some of it is is why there's so, it's so infamous, this painting. Um, but it, it's something that some artists would say, or some art historians would say, is really not a great piece, but the stories behind it and all the things that have happened to it have led it to have this air of mystery and and suspense. Uh, it's, it's behind a bulletproof glass today, a piece of bulletproof glass today. It is visited by millions of people. The Louvre is the most visited museum in the world. Uh, it is kept at a certain temperature. There is gas that's pumped into the area uh, where it is located and uh, to preserve it. It was hidden in World War II so that Hitler couldn't get uh, his hands on it. He really wanted this painting. So let's talk about, well, who is it and what? Well, who is she? And why is it so important? So again, these are just images of of her with the crowds all around her. So it's a relatively small painting, two feet six inches by one foot nine inches. I know that when I saw it in college when I was there, I thought it was incredibly dull. Uh, it, it is very, very brown, and it's aged because in the 1800s they put a lacquer over it uh, to protect it, which actually has browned it. So let's talk about maybe who she was. So most art historians uh, would say her name is, is Lisa Del Giacondo. She is the wife of a wealthy silk merchant from uh, the city of, of Venice. He actually went out to Venice and painted this for uh, Lisa Giacondo's husband. Uh, she originally did have eyebrows. That's what the freshmen always ask me. Where's her eyebrows? Uh, they believe, though, uh, in a cleaning, when this was cleaned in the 1800s, before they put that varnish on there, that she had very thin eyebrows, but they were almost cleaned off. That's the problem with cleaning with uh, uh, or cleaning too harshly or using chemicals to clean uh, these old, old masterpieces, is that you'll lose some of the color. So, yes, she would have had eyebrows. They've done scans, and there are impressions there that would have had the eyebrows. But, you know, why is this important? So that's who she was. Uh, so what Leonardo perfects here is atmospheric perspective. The further into the distance you get, the hazier the object becomes, and that helps to create that sense of a realistic depth, or depth um, in a open air setting like this is because she's meant to be kind of sitting on a porch or a colonnade high up on a hill we see some roads behind her we see these uh mountains back here it looks as if uh there's a waterway back here with a bridge and she's near a coastline uh we also see that sumato technique that that smoky eye that she gets here around her eyes and around her lips um and then people always talk about the mona lisa smile is she smiling uh, is she frowning? Is she smirking? And the reason why uh, it's so hard to pinpoint is that smoky quality. You just don't know uh, what her expression is, which has led her to be mysterious. Some people have said, is this Leonardo in drag? Is this, uh, uh, you know, is this somebody that, is she even a real person? But that's kind of the, some of the reasons why it's led to this air of uh, mysteriousness. And then she has a translucent veil over her head, which you can kind of just see the line there in her forehead, and you see the veil kind of covering her over here. Uh, the painting actually has been cut down. It was a little bit larger, but Napoleon, here we are again talking about this guy, uh, had a frame that he wanted it fit in, and it was cut down. Now, in Barcelona, uh, they were going through an old museum, and they found a copy of the Mona Lisa that they believe would have been in the original colors and size of the original Mona Lisa, and they think it was done by one of Leonardo's students. So in a few images, we'll take a look uh, at, at what that image looked like. This is the one. So this is the one they think that uh, a student of Leonardo's did. And whoop, let me go back there. And they believe, though, that this was possibly created by a student of his, and this is what the original coloring would have looked like. So you see the colonnade behind her, again, which is she's high up on this porch at a very nice home in Venice. The background is not realistic at all. He kind of like brought in uh, influences of the Alps uh, into where he was sitting. And he, she would not have been painted outside. She was actually painted, they believe, inside his studio. And he added this background all in 
from memory. Now, they don't know why he never gave it to Lisa Giacondo's husband. They aren't sure if that Leonardo just never was happy with it, so he never finished it, and he kept working on it his entire life, or that the family never paid him, so he never gave the, uh, the painting over. And there we go. We have our two Mona Lisas. Uh, I'm still kind of partial to the, uh, the brownish one just because that's the one I grew up with, and uh, that's the one I got to see in person. It's famous people go to visit her. We got Puff Daddy down there. We got Eminem. People have made fun of her. We got damn Miley Silas twerking on her. All right, so we are going to stop there. That is going to be it for our intro to uh, the High Renaissance, where we are going to pick up with Michelangelo in our next video. See you guys next time.